Sorry, I'm Richard Dine. I am the cinematography specialist in uh, 35 millimeter, which is a final film project um, and the film program here uh, at Full Sail. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a lecture entitled Don't Hurt Yourself. And we're going to talk with a uh, uh, industry specialist about stunts and how you can integrate them into uh, projects you may be working on or something you may be interested in or something uh, that you see and uh, are interested in how they did this kind of things. Uh, so um, our, our guest today is a, a director, a, a stunt coordinator, and a stunt man. So uh, let's hear it for Christopher Lip. Hey, Chris, good to see you, man. <laughs> how are you guys doing? Excellent. I'm going to put my water down here. You can never have too much water. That's rule number one. <laughs> Indeed. So uh, thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to Full Sail for having me. And thanks, Richard, for giving up your time. Uh, yeah, so tonight will be really uh, fun and just completely uh, just fly off the, uh, the cuff. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions and, and give you guys some insight. I'm a stuntman and a filmmaker. And so uh, chances are I could probably answer almost anything you can throw at me with regards to action sequences all the way through to filmmaking and anything of that nature. So. Um, yeah. So, so my idea was to just get to, uh, to know Chris a little bit. So uh, what, what, what's your background? How does someone, you know, wh where, where do you come from? Yeah, that's, that's actually uh, the, 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 usually the first question I hear. And uh, I have a martial arts gymnastics background. Um, I grew up here in, uh, in Central Florida. And uh, my parents moved us down from Virginia when I was about three. And, you know, Disney World had opened and sort of the land of opportunity back then. And, um, but I got into martial arts and gymnastics when I was in high school. And, but filmmaking was, was always the end goal. Uh, but growing up in Orlando at the time, there really weren't the resources that you guys have now. I mean, the, you know, Full Sail was here, but it was really about music production. UCF didn't have a film program. Valencia was still in its infancy stages with that. So what do you do? And uh, right out of high school, I didn't really have a plan. So uh, I went to work for Disney. Big surprise. I was, you know, we grew up going to the parks, and Disney was sort of woven into the fabric of my childhood. And so I was a, I was a Ninja Turtle at uh, Disney and Gem Studios from 90 to 93. So I, I don't know, maybe some of you guys weren't even born yet. But uh, if you were a little kid running around back then and loved the Ninja Turtles and came to the park, you probably saw me. But uh, so I did that for a while. And then I did the Indiana Jones stunt show at Disney. I did the Wild West stunt show at Universal. And um, it was really at that time, that was more of my film school because uh, you know, I knew that I wanted to get into the stunt you know, realm. And, uh, but ultimately, ultimately that it would hopefully lead to filmmaking. And it did. And so, um, you know, I worked on some local TV shows and features here. I got my SAG card on the Mortal Kombat TV series, which, which shot at Disney, and then uh, moved out to L.A. in 99, and, and the, the, um, the journey continued. And then, you know, but ultimately I knew that, um, the film, like I said, filmmaking was where I wanted to be ultimately. And so uh, just sort of over the years, just sort of picked things up as I went along and bought all my own equipment and started shooting and editing and... You know, uh, but again, you guys have a great resource here. I mean, if there was a if there was a full sale here when I was, you know, getting into it, I definitely would have been here. So uh, that's pretty much my background. I've been doing it for about 20 years now, and uh, I've worked on tons of you know a lot of uh, tons of TV and a lot of film, and I've doubled a lot of guys over the years. And uh, yeah, it's been a great journey. But the nice thing is that you know, um, unlike a lot of other industries where uh, you may be working in a different industry than the film. Uh, realm and you really want to get into film, the nice thing about stunt work is that I was working with the people that I was ultimately going to be collaborating with eventually. So, uh, you know, I was on the sets with the producers and the, you know, the cinematographers and the, and the production managers that I ultimately would be on on the other side of the camera. So it was sort of all interwoven uh, and really worked out well. So I've kept those connections over the years and some of them have helped me uh, uh, on the filmmaking journey as well. So that's sort of how everything kind of came full circle. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, what kind of movies when you were a kid, obviously you uh, kind of came into this when you were young. What kind of movies were your, uh, your your muse, if you will? Well, again, I you know you're gonna hear the D word a lot tonight. I love Disney films. I mean, my parents, uh, you know, back then we would go to Fort Wilderness and they had a um, they had a fireside uh, uh, sort of an outdoor movie venue, and we'd go to Fort Wilderness and see all the old Disney films, and I loved that stuff. But uh, you know, it was uh, I just I loved even as a little kid, I just loved good story, and um, you know, there's. It's funny being a stuntman. Everyone assumes that oh, you know that I, I'm the type of filmmaker that just wants to shoot action movies. But I really don't. I mean, if 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 the action supports the story, absolutely. But mindless action and and sort of a you know just visual bombardment is without substance. It's it it is what it is. So, um, but yeah, I love the you know I loved you know the oh my gosh, uh, the you know, Herbie the Love Bug and all the old you know. I mean, I've loved all the animated films, Peter Pan and all that stuff. But really, I think the film that had the most impact on me where 
the sort of the timeline of my life really shifted was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, I remember when I was I was sitting in my room one time, one of the rare times that I was actually attempting to do homework, and uh, my dad came in. He said, "Hey, the guy that played Han Solo." Now you guys got to realize this is 1981. Uh, there was only three Star Wars films back then. And uh, he said, the guy that played Han Solo is in this new movie about this archaeologist, and he gets involved in all these crazy scenarios and, and, and treasure hunting. He said, do you want to go see it? And I was like, do I want to go see it? Of course I do. So of course I closed the book, and my dad and I went to uh, to the theater, and we saw Raiders, and uh, it it completely, I mean, I, it, it just, I got bit by the film bug, and it just, like I said, just changed my life. And uh, it, it just because the sense of, and again, I, you know, I use Raiders as a lot as a great example because that's, I mean, a lot of people consider that as an action film, but it's really, that's an incredible film. If you watch that film from a cinematography standpoint, from a writing standpoint, from an acting standpoint, pretty much across the board, it, it's, it's, it's pretty close to perfect. Um, and it really created the real sense, not only on screen, but, you know, off screen as well as that whole, the whole filmmaking uh, realm that I knew I wanted to be part of somehow, but at that age didn't really know yet. But yeah, that was a, that was a huge impact. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. It's one of those movies that uh, holds up to time. Absolutely. You watch it 20 yeah. years later, and it's still still relevant and still, this is cool. Some of the special effects, a little campy now, but still sure, amazing. Sure, but amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I went to the 25th anniversary at the at the Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles, and we I, I saw it on the big screen. That's the first time I'd seen it since, you know, 81, uh, on the, you know, in a theatrical environment, and it, it, it was phenomenal. I mean, the sound was still incredible. And the, awesome. the, you know, the boulder still was like, oh. it was great. So yeah, classic film. So I have to ask, um, the lifespan of a stuntman uh, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, the impact on your body. Sure, sure. I mean, the actual lifespan or the career lifespan? Because uh. <laughs> <laughs> they're both a little different. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's, uh, it's interesting because for those of you who are looking to get into the stunt realm, it's... Um, Obviously, a physical background definitely helps, but uh, it's it's sort of a catch-22 because films are getting bigger, and you know they want the action bigger and faster, and and but by the uh, with all those advances as well, there's also the the, uh, the safety features that are advancing too. So in many ways, they're advancing together, but things are getting more dangerous just because you know a 50-foot high fall used to be a big deal. Now, unless you're you know falling 200 feet or you know you're getting ratcheted across a football field. So, um, but you know it's it's really uh, it just depends. I mean, I, uh, up until three years ago, I was injury-free, you know, in a 20-year career. So um, it's we, we try to be as safe as we can, and and cer certainly you know stunt coordinators really try to do their best with that as well. But like anything other, you know, whether it's motocross or horse racing or anything, you name it, you name a physical sport, football. I mean anything. Mm -hmm. Injuries can happen no matter how safe you try to be. So, um, but yeah, I mean you can you can stay safe and and have a good run of it. And uh, I knew it was something I didn't want to do forever. Um, I knew it was a way to get into filmmaking, and um, in many ways it, it definitely served that goal. But. Uh, yeah, but I, you know, to answer to answer uh, the second part of your question, I mean, I, you know, I have friends that are in their late 60s, early 70s that are still, you know, out there doing fight scenes. I mean, you know, it's it's you know doing sword work or you know or a lot of driving. I mean, you you, yeah. you can do driving. It gets just sort of all out of the impact side of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it just really just depends. <clears throat> Uh, so let's try and make things a little more relevant for uh, some some of the uh, filmmakers uh, tuned in today. Um, so let's talk about some common stunts and maybe some stunts that uh, you don't necessarily need a stuntman uh, for or a double, or maybe you can bring um, uh, an actor up to speed um, coordination-wise pretty easy. Do you, do you know some, some things like that or some? Uh... Absolutely, yeah. So uh, I can't see everyone's hands, but does anyone have any upcoming projects that they're thinking about using action in? Oh, OK, yeah, so quite a bit. Um, you know, it's really. Uh, a lot of times, especially in a lot of, lot of you know, uh, films nowadays and even TV shows, they try to use the actors when they can. Uh, I'm here to let you know that no actor does all their own stunts. There are many that do a lot, that, that really do a, a, a large uh, part of them. But in, in many cases, you know, if, if, if these you know, A-list actors get hurt and the production shuts down, that costs time, money, and energy. And they just don't, studios just, you know, they can't afford it. So um, there are, you know, there are, Stunt doubles are used often, but they do. You know, nowadays they have face replacement, which is crazy. I mean, I've done straight-on shots that were me, and then over my face they'd put whoever, and uh, so that definitely makes it, you know, uh, um, safer and you know allows the the actors to be as much a part of the story and the action as possible. But uh, you know, it just depends. I mean, fight scenes are are, are 
are a lot, I mean, we always, in stunts, we always call fight scenes our bread and butter because every, you know, that's sort of the base of action. There's always, you know, a base of conflict. There's gonna be a fight scene of some sort. And then it builds from there, whether it goes into a car chase or a foot chase or a motorcycle chase or what have you. So, um, but when it comes, the great thing about, uh, you know, Orlando, as we were kind of talking about earlier, is that you guys have the theme parks here. And th those are a great resource. Uh, I'm by, you know, so what you don't want to do is call them up and say, hey, Chris Leps told me to give you a call. Um, but what I am saying is that, you know, between Universal and Disney, there's a handful of live shows that have top stunt professionals. And uh, many of them have worked in L.A. and many of them work here in the Southwest. I'm sorry, the Southeast. Um, Atlanta. In fact, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm kind of scruffy tonight. I'm actually working in Atlanta in a couple weeks on a film. So Atlanta is really, really uh, doing very well. Um, but there's a lot, my point is there's a lot of stunt professionals that live and work here, and they're a great resource. And there's a producer many years ago that gave me uh, some great advice, and he said, um, you know, we, when you ask people for help, they might be less inclined to help. But if you ask someone for advice, they'll always give you your, their advice. <laughs> so people want to give advice, right? So um, if you do have a project that you're thinking about having some action, you know, Google, uh, Green Room, you know, Indiana Jones Green Room, or you know, wherever the uh, the uh, Sinbad show, uh, you know, Green Room, or call the the main line of Disney and Universal and ask to be connected to those and you know to those um, those facilities. And I'm I'm sure you're going to get someone on the phone that'll be able to point you in the right direction, or offer to meet for lunch or, or coffee or whatever, and say, hey, I just want to pick your brain. And you know, I'm I'm a full sale student. I'm a filmmaker. I have, I have a movie coming up that I, I think I might need some action for. Can I just get your advice on some things? And I, I guarantee that you'll find someone that will be happy to help and who will definitely know what they're talking about because, like I said, you know, they're, they're in it every day. What you don't want is a daredevil. That's the difference between a stuntman and a daredevil. A daredevil is someone who says, yeah, I'll jump off that 50-foot building, and they might do it once and then be driven away in an ambulance. A stuntman or a stunt coordinator or a stunt professional, I should say, because there are top stunt women in the business that are that are far more advanced in the physical realm than even I am, um, they, uh, they'll do it a number of times and safely. And so they, you know, they, like I said, they know the ins and outs. So those are the people that you want to connect with for your projects. Um, and if you have actors that have a physical background, I mean, you know, actors are, are incredibly, you know, gifted individuals. I mean, they are, a lot of them have a physical background. They might be boxers. They might be sword, you know, uh, sword specialists. Get them involved in the action as much as possible. But depending on how advanced it gets, that's where you want to sort of turn to a stunt professional and really ask their take on where we, we should use a double, where we shouldn't. Uh, a, a lot of times in film, we'll do what's called over the shoulders. So basically, I will fight, uh, I will, I will, whoever I'm doubling, I'll be that character and I'll fight the real actor so that the camera can cover their face. And then we'll do the opposite of that, where I'll fight, or the, my actor will fight that stunt double. So they always have the real actor, but they're always paired up with one of the stunt professionals so they keep it safe and, you know, for choreography reasons and things like that, so. But yeah, I mean, again, uh, to answer your question, it really, you know, you've got the resources here with the, 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 um, the theme parks and the stunt professionals that, that also work, you know, in the, in the real industry here and in the Southeast as well. So definitely reach out to those guys. They're, they're, they're and, and girls, they're top notch. <clears throat> what are some, uh some common uh, pitfalls or um, stunts that you see done that um, they should, you, you would think they should have a stunt person in there. You know, car stuff, a lot can go wrong. Car stuff is much more advanced than people uh, give credit to. You know, we're all, we all drive, right? <clears throat> and so we come very, we become very complacent when it comes to, st to uh, car stunts because we all drive automobiles and, you know, everyone's, you know, we've all done it. We've all yanked on the e-brake in an empty parking lot. and th I mean, the YouTube is flooded with videos of things going wrong and guys crashing their cars into poles and light poles and things like that. So, um, you know, car work is not about muscle. It's all about finesse. And it really takes, you know, you really need to kind of know what you're doing. And so um, I see a lot go wrong with car stuff, especially on independent films. Uh, people forget that they have to, uh, this is a classic, and it's it's not funny, but it's, like I said, YouTube is flooded with people that forget to disengage the airbags on a vehicle when they go to do a car jump, and they blow the airbags and break their noses, and it's just, you know, there's there's a lot that goes into car work. I mean, it's interesting now, cars, I mean, we, there, there are uh, picture houses out in L.A. that actually, that's all they do is prep cars for films and television, because they ha there's so many safety features on cars now. You can't pull up an e-brake and slide a car anymore because the electronic system kicks in that won't allow it. You can't do a reverse 180 because you can't go from reverse to drive instantly. And so these, these, these um, picture car houses will, will put these cars through, uh, through the system and they'll dismantle the airbags and they'll kill the ABS and they do all the things that, that make it safe for the professionals. So um, 
you, you know, when you start to get into car stuff, you know, you definitely want to hire someone who, who at least is aware of, of, of car work and how it works with, and again, not only safety-wise, but for story, you want to make it look the best because you don't want to look like it was backyard because then it brings your production value down. Producer or, you know, another filmmaker watches that and says, wait a minute, that looked kind of, I don't know how they, if they had someone uh, helping them out with that, so. How much uh, control do you have over the stunts that you do? Uh, qu quite a bit. I mean, we can always say no. <laughs> but the nice thing is it, it, it's uh, you never, in this day and age, you know, you're never going to get called for a job that the stunt coordinator doesn't know you. Uh, and you're never going to show up on set with any surprises. You never walk onto the set and go, wait, we're doing what today? Uh, you're always, it's always a relationship of some sort with, you know, whether I'm working for a stunt coordinator or I'm hiring, hiring someone. And uh, especially now with, like I said, with television and film getting bigger and bigger, uh, there's usually a rehearsal of some sort. So you usually know what you're, you're getting into. And, and again, a coordinator wouldn't hire someone who, who wasn't prepared to do the job. But um, again, depending on how involved the action is, I mean, I've had months of rehearsal. I mean, I was, I was Johnny Depp's stunt double on Pirates of the Caribbean 4. And we had three months of rehearsal for that film. And even when I'm not a stunt double, if I'm just on the stunt team, often we have weeks and even months of rehearsal if there's big action sequences. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you rarely run into that situation where, um, where you're, you get involved in something you're not aware of. Or, but as far as control, I mean, we, you know, the, the coordinate, it's the stunt coordinator's job to design the action. And they obviously work hand in hand with production and the director. And, um, you know, we definitely get to have some input on that. Say, well, I think I could, you know, you know, do it this way better, or you know, I could, you know, that way better. But yeah, so it's 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 all about communication, just like filmmaking in general. So, has there been something you've said no to? Ah, uh, something I said no to. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> um, there's some things I should have said no to. Uh, there's definitely. Um, you know, like I said, I, I, I won't mention names or projects, but uh, three years ago, my back was broken in two places. Mm. And it was one of those situations where I should have spoken up. I did not agree with how the stunt was set up. And but, you know, again, it's all about it's filmmaking is collaboration. I don't care what anybody says. And uh, it's really it's a team effort. And so you try to have those conversations. But by the same token, you want to be a team player and you want to try and make it work. And I, I truly did. But uh, yeah, I was doing a wire stunt, and I was I was dropped prematurely, going backwards about 20 miles an hour, about four feet off the ground, and so I landed right on my butt and uh, fractured my vertebrae in two places. But um, in many ways, it was the best thing ever happened to me because, you know, like I said at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, filmmaking was always the end goal, and it really it got me, you know. You know, this industry can very much be the golden handcuff. So, you know, you're all here because you're passionate about filmmaking or the film industry of some way, shape, or form, or, or music or television or what have you. The sooner you can get on the road to your passion, the better. And so with stunts, it's interesting because for many years, I, you know, I, turn, you know I, I put my creative endeavors on the back burner because I was working so much and it's really hard to turn down a paycheck and you want to be involved with that project and you want to meet this individual and all these different reasons that we have. But um, like I said, when I broke my back, it was, I was laying in the hospital bed thinking, what am I doing with my life? I, gotta, I want to be making films and I don't want to be in a wheelchair when I'm doing it. So. Um, uh, uh, so it was, uh, it, like I said, it, in many ways, it was one of the, the uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me. But uh, yeah, I've never said no. That pr I probably should have. Um, but there have been great moments w of, of good collaboration with some really top-notch stunt coordinators that uh, that um, we came up with some really great action, and, and I was very fortunate and proud to be a part of. So, who's in control of your safety? Ultimately, the stunt coordinator. Oh well, I mean, ultimately, it starts with with the performer, for sure. I mean, it's your job to say, hey, I'm not comfortable with that, or maybe I could do it this way, or whatever. Um, but the stunt coordinator is the, uh, um, they're sort of the, the head of the stunt department. You know, as you guys, uh, I'm sure you know, there's on films and even television, there's, you know, um, department heads. And so the stunt coordinator is the, the department head of the stunt department. And oftentimes, that person is also a second unit director, and they will do both. But many times, those, are, those individuals are two different people as well. Um, but yeah, they're, they're responsible for designing the action and for setting up the action and working with the director and making sure you know, he gets what he wants and making sure we can perform it. And so yeah, it all, it all kind of boils down to the stunt coordinator. So if things go wrong, he's kind of in the hot seat. But when things go right, you know, he's the champion. So, <laughs> so as a stunt co coordinator, how involved with the cinematography are you and the cinematographer? Now, now more so than in the past, because it's, and, and you know, 
many of my friends, and, and I've had I've been in the situation too where I've done second unit directing, where um, where they really want the action shot uh, by someone who definitely has come up that route. And I've worked with a lot of fantastic second unit directors who who don't have an action background, but a lot that do. And so now more than ever, I think stunt coordinators are more involved with the the cinematography and how things are shot. In fact, that's a great question because now you know with previs and and you know you can make a movie on an iPhone now and upload it to YouTube, you know, 30 minutes later, the stunt coordinators are really more and more responsible for creating the action in sort of a pre-visual environment, live action, and then they'll put together a rehearsal tape that what the production will be shooting on the day. And so then the director can see it beforehand and say, oh, that's great, I'd like to change that, maybe we can flip this around. So, it, I mean, like I said, the resources now for filmmaking, it's, uh, it's unbelievable, as you guys know. <clears throat> what are, um it just the the, the difficult and the genre of stunt. What is it with the most difficult kind of stunts? Oh gosh, I mean, it really just depends on the individual. I mean, for for my part, I've never been a horse or a motorcycle guy. You know, um, there are some incredible horse and motorcycle uh, stunt performers, and those are the guys that really either either grew up with it or had a burning passion for it. And I just never did. I wasn't around motorcycles growing up. I was never really a horse guy. And so I, I, I mean, I've done a couple scenes here and there, but not, it wasn't really what I was interested in. So, but um, I would say where a lot of the injuries come into play, gosh, it's really, I mean, car stuff can get really gnarly. I mean, you know, you got big cannon rolls and pipe ramps and things, and you know, you're, you're thousands of tons of metal and, you know, being thrown around. And, but um, interestingly enough, a lot of people get hurt doing fight scenes because they're, they're you know, you always, you always, get hurt on the simple stuff, right? You know, you think, oh, I just have to run and jump over that wall, okay, cool, and you sort of dismiss it in your brain and then you roll an ankle right before you get to the wall. So it's, so it really, you know, you just, you have to have your game face on at all times and have to really stay focused, just like, you know, if you weren't uh, on any, you know, any project as any crew member. Um, but fight scenes, you know, a lot of things can go wrong. People to get punched in the, <laughs> in the mouth and I've gotten hit by a few actors, uh, not intentionally, of course, but um, you know, it's, uh, so um, it really just depends. It's just, you know, I mean, just you try and be as safe as you can and, and keep everyone safe around you. And, and to that point, stunts is far more mental than it is physical because you're not only responsible for yourself, many times you're working with the actor or another stunt performer and you've gotta be aware of your surroundings. So it's really a lot going on upstairs and really thinking about things from not only an action uh, perspective, but also a production perspective, so. How do you, you personally prep, and how do you prep with um, your collaborators for a stunt? Sure, yeah, again, uh, usually rehearsal day, uh, or two, or three, depending on how big the action is, and um, you know, we all have our pad bags, you know, you've got a, a big giant bag that has every kind of pad in it, and we have our back pads, and we got our fire stuff, and we have our knee pad, knees and elbows and all that stuff. Um, and again, depending on how uh, involved the action is, we'll probably get some rehearsal. But oftentimes you don't. Oftentimes it's sort of expected that like, hey, you're, you know, you're a stunt professional. I expect you to come in and be ready for work, you know, and we're going to throw you in a car and you'll, I mean, you know, we have on our resumes all expected abilities because there should just certain physical aspects that you should be able to handle. So um, again, it really just depends on the level of, of action that's gonna be taking place and if that requires rehearsal or not, but, um, and also how fast production is shooting. Oftentimes there isn't enough, enough time for that, so. You, you touched on it real quick, but what kind of equipment does this stunt person have? Uh, the more, the better. I mean, you definitely want to have a pad bag that has, you know, your basics, your knees, your elbows, your back pads, your ankle braces. Um, we also have harness, a number of harnesses. We have full body harnesses, just seat harnesses um, for you know, a lot of wire work now, a lot of green screen work. And um, so those are all your basics. If you don't have those, don't don't go to set because a coordinator will probably send you home for not having <laughs> the, just the basic <laughs> equipment. Right. Um, and then it gets more advanced from there. You can have Nomex and gel for fire stuff. You can have your all your car. You know, we, we have our own uh, safety belts for cars because we don't use standard seat belts when we're driving. We throw in lap belts and five-point harnesses and things like that. But it can get crazy into the car stuff. You have helmets and neck braces. I mean, it's just like NASCAR or any any professional motorsport. Um, you know, and then the motor, motocross guys have all their stuff. So it's it can really, you know... We usually have a, a section in our garage that's just, you know, <laughs> your stunt bags, and you go there, and you know, what am I doing today? Okay, I need that, I need that. You throw it in the bag, and you head to set. But often, we just keep it in our car just in case, because, you know, surprises do come up. We're like, oh, now you're doubling this guy today. Oh, okay, great, so. Um, all right, what's the scariest thing you have done on set? All right.
right. Uh, scariest thing, I was doubling for, anybody, who likes the Red Hot Chili Peppers? Anybody? Oh, cool. Uh, I was stunt doubling for Anthony Kiedis, the lead singer on the, the uh, music video, By The Way. So if you YouTube that, uh, where he is um, kidnapped uh, in a taxi cab and driven all through the, the streets of LA and flee and the rest of the guys have to come save him. So uh, we were doing a scene where um, Anthony busts out the window of the taxi cab with his elbow and gets out onto the the taxi window and basically is kind of like surfing the window and holding onto the roof. And I was working with the directors, uh, um, oh shame on me, I forget their names right now, but uh, great, great uh, um, dual directing team and they uh, they wanted to see this, this particular take in one take. Uh, we could do it multiple times, but they didn't want the action to be cut up in the editing room. So I had to be on the, the taxi cab on the window, holding onto the top of the roof, and we did what's called a near miss, where two cars go at each other and they, they, all, they, they both veer different directions at the last minute. And they wanted to see that going right into Anthony's character jumping in the back of Flea's pickup truck. And so our car was going 35 miles an hour, and the oncoming car was going 35 miles an hour, so that's 70 miles an hour. So if I had peeled off the car, if I had lost my grip or whatever, I would have gone right into the grill of the oncoming car, and that would have been the end of that. And I wouldn't be here today. So uh, I, I definitely, that was, uh, while it wasn't necessarily the most physically difficult, it was definitely the most focused, one of the more focused uh, I've been in my career. And um, we did it a couple times. It went great and jumped in the back of the truck and, you know, got the shot and they loved it. So it was really good. But uh, I think that was definitely the more, one, like I said, one of the more focused. And Sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. So um, what, what are the hiring qualifications? Uh, great question. I mean, you know, again, it really, it's tough, right? Because it's the, it's the ultimate catch-22. To get a job, you need experience, but you can't get experience without getting the job. Um, you know, it's like getting your SAG card. How do you get your SAG card? You need to work on a SAG project, but you have to have your SAG card to work on a SAG project, okay? Um, but there are ways in. But ultimately, it's really, you know, want to build a resume. And, I mean, you know, some people are lucky enough to have, um, you know, either dads, moms, brothers and sisters in the industry that sort of, you know, took them under their wing and gave them some some lessons and they got involved that way or I was not one of those individuals. I, you know, was a, just all on my own and just sort of like again, I was fortunate enough to have the physical background and then to come from kind of the live show thing and but uh, it's really about just building a resume and um, and and you know, as you guys know now, we live in such a a, a visual age. It's really about having a demo reel and, a, and to just show what you can do because no one's going to hire you off a resume in these days. I mean, that's great for the credit list, but ultimately they wanna, they're going to want to see what you can do because so many people have resumes in any industry, certainly not just the stunt industry, where they, you know, they have a lot of credits, but I need to physically see what you can do. So it's really about that demo reel. You got to have that. Got to have you know, just like a musician, right? You're a musician, great. Let me hear you sing. Show me. It's a show me business that we're in. So. <laughs> um, What's an average pay, uh, or what? I mean, is there a certain stunts pay more, or they do? Well, it, well, to be to uh, basically, I mean, when we're in the Screen Actors Guild, uh, just like any actor, and so um, now sag after, as you guys, I'm sure know, they they merged. So we're in the, we're in the same union as you know, I'm in the same union as Tom Cruise. Um, we're not in the same. Pay level, though, obviously. Um, but so we, yeah, so we get the very, we get the basic, you know, daily, weekly rate uh, contracts and overtime. But the great thing about the stunt industry is that you get what's called a stunt adjustment. So that's where a dollar value is assigned, and it's not, it's not written in any sort of hardbound book. It's like, okay, wait, you did 100 for high fall, you get, you know, extra, you know, money. It's really up to the stunt coordinator. But um, that stunt adjustment uh, factors into how dangerous the stunt is, how many times you had to do it, all that good stuff. And so the nice thing is that that's wrapped up in your daily rate, and so your overtime compounds that. So, I mean, without getting into specifics, it's quite luc it can be quite lucrative if you work. I mean, um, I, I have a lot of friends who have some really nice houses because they, they worked their butts off in the stunt industry for many years. And uh, earlier, you know, much more so because the VHS residuals were much better than the online residuals are now, unfortunately. So... Um, you know, that's, and I can talk to you guys individually if you need to about that, but uh, it, the industry's changing a lot. So it's, uh, you know, if you're, if you're getting into this industry because you're seeing the dollar signs, I hope you have some other, uh, some other motivations because, it, you know, it's, it's a tough industry. It's, there's a lot of competition 
and the residuals are shrinking and filmmaking is getting you know more expensive and they want more return on their investment and it's there's a lot that goes into it so uh, you, you better it better be your passion and you know if it is you know you'll be you'll do great are there any kind of certifications or uh, renewals of certifications or anything like that you you have to undertake or is it just sure surely your resume like you said or your yeah yeah great question I mean uh, in the United States no uh, in the UK, they actually do have a, a, it's part of their guild where you actually have to be certified in a, in a certain number of aspects of, of the stunt industry. Um, the United States, not, not so much. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're scuba certified, obviously you have to keep up with that. Any, anything that's, that's sort of, uh, um, structured outside of the stunt industry, you know, relating to another, uh, field, if they require those certifications, you would obviously need those. And we actually do need scuba certification to work on many uh, water projects, just depending if it's tank work or if it's open water work or things like that. But as far as stunt certifications, there aren't any, at, at least not yet. They may kick in at some point, but for now, you're, you're fine. <laughs> um, <clears throat> talk to me about directing. You, uh, this is something you've kind of, uh, you're passionate about. You, you took this, this route. Uh, from a, a stunt man to a stunt coordinator, and you kind of worked your way up, met the people, like you said, you talked about, uh, and kind of took yourself into the role that is directing. Is that, that your ultimate passion there? Absolutely, absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, very briefly, I, you know, that was, like I said, stunts was sort of my film school. You know, there, there weren't, I didn't, you know, get the grades that I should have to go to, to school. And uh, again, the options were limited back then. So I just dove right in. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're, a stunt guy, you know, what do you what do you shoot? The type of movies that you make when you're coming up, you make action movies, and so. But a lot of I, I sort of attribute a lot of my uh, filmmaking background to those early years because you learn a lot about camera work, you learn a lot about editing, you learn a lot about story and continuity and all those things. So that I knew was ultimately factoring into where I wanted to be, and um, and yeah, it's I started I started uh, out in documentaries because they're you know as you guys I'm sure know they're they're on the cheaper end of, of productions. Um, you don't need as many permits, you don't have to pay actors and things like that, and there's a lot less overhead. So I started out in documentaries and got into short films and been doing shorts for many years now and got some future projects lined up. And so it's it's really just, you know, like anything else, the building block process. And um, uh, again, it's a visual industry, you know, and if you get your, your films into festivals or you can get them into the hands of the right producers and things like that, and um, it's those connections really come into play. I mean, they uh, it's interesting, though, because it, in many ways, you have to be careful about w how you climb the ladder and what ladder you climb, because uh, the industry is very quick to label you, right? I mean, so if you're an actor, and you know your your day job may be waiting tables or bartending, well, they, you know, a lot of times that can be used, you know, or at least you can be seen in a negative light. Stunts is no different. I mean, and in many w cases, w much worse. If you're a stunt guy or a stunt girl. That's what you do, right? You're the action guy. Okay, that's great. We'll call you when we need you to jump off the building. It's like, well, no, wait a minute. I've written this script and I got into this festival and I just won this award for my creativity. So it's, again, you you got to put that image in their head of what your ultimate passion is. And um, you know, your day job can sometimes you can be associated with that negatively, but uh, ultimately, you know, like I said, if you're passionate about it, you're going to rise to the top, and ultimately, you'll get you'll gravitate towards the right people and vice versa, and you'll get that project uh, in, in front of the right person. So, and that's really where, where it's, it's helped out. Excellent. Um, before there was reality, there was quality. <laughs> yeah. This is a, a quote of yours? It is a quote of mine, yeah. I, um, you know, not to be taken out of context, there's a, there's a ton of great reality content out there, but I feel that when reality shows really kicked into high gear, they they really it changed the industry in many ways f in a negative uh, way because um, content just became it became very voyeuristic. The story elements went away because these people were seeing shows that could be done really cheap, and you know I mean it, it's kind of scary. You you look at the top. I mean I certainly certainly don't know the list offhand, but. I think the top 20 YouTube videos of all time, obviously many of them are, are music videos, but a lot of them are people falling and doing some really stupid stuff. And so reality shows teach his own, and this is certainly you know, uh, no disrespect to some of the great reality shows that are out there. Um, they, in many ways, they sort of conditioned us to be this voyeuristic society that, that 
sits in the comfort of our living room and, and either judges or, or sort of, I don't know, takes some weird twisted pleasure in seeing other people's misfortune. And so for me, I, I, that was my experience with it. That's what I was seeing. I'm certainly not saying that that's the case across the board. So personally, I'm not really a fan of reality shows. Um, I love the do-it-yourself stuff. That is fantastic. It's a great resource. I love Treehouse Masters. If anybody has been to Seattle, go to That's Treehouse cool. Point. It, oh, it's one of the best nights sleep I've ever had in my life. It was amazing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, some of the, you know, uh, these housewife shows and these, you know, certain parts of the country, these cities and the real world and all that, it's, it's, not, it's not my thing. And, I, again, I just, I feel it conditions us in, in kind of a negative way. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm old school. I love, give me a good story. You know, give me, you know, Give me a small cast that's story driven, you know, make me feel something, right? That's what we're here. That's why we're in this industry. We, we feel something, whether it's music or television or, or production or writing or directing. We make me feel something. Don't blow up a CGI character unless it's written well into the story, you know? So again, I'm, I'm all about, you know, those the, at the heart and the core of this industry is good story. And I feel like that's where many productions and many studios are dropping the ball. Um, but the ones that, that do it well, boy, they really, you know, I'm a big, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, it's funny, I'm the stunt guy, but I'm a big baby. I'm always the one crying on my girlfriend's shoulder in the movies. Good story. So that's what I love, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> um, before we go to questions, I got one more. Um, best craft services were on what movie? Wow. That is a great question. A, a, big, a good friend of mine always um, talks about Iron Man. And the best craft services were there. So okay. what do you got? Uh, you know what? I have to say the best craft service I ever had was on Pirates 4. Actually, all the Pirates films. I worked. I was in the stunt team for, for 1, 2, and 3, and then I became Johnny's Double in the fourth film. And boy, uh, Teddy's, Teddy's Catering. Uh, is it Nakamura? I forget his last name. Shame on me. He's amazing. Uh, Tony's, Cater Tony's Catering is fantastic. They're one of the big ones. But uh, it's nice when, you know, being coming from up the independent realm, and you guys take note of this as well, you gotta do one of two things, preferably both. Either pay people well or feed them well. And oftentimes in independent films, you can't pay them well, so please feed them well because you're gonna have a much happier cast crew and anyone that's associated with the film. So I usually try and do both on my independent projects, but you know, it's tough because um, you know, if you're funding them yourself, you know, you have to you definitely have to budget it out and, and see where the money goes. So do you have anything uh, you can think of you'd like to add or talk about? Or? No, I mean, I'm really here for you guys. You know, like I said, I, I want to be a, a good resource, uh, an extension of the school. I didn't go to film. Uh, I didn't go to full sale, obviously. But, um, uh, you know, I have a lot of connections here and I, I want to help you guys any way I can and, and answer your questions, uh, whether it's, like I said, filmmaking, stunts, almost anything I could probably uh, t uh, answer for you. So, OK, uh, so let's. Um, uh, to ask some questions. If you uh, would like to ask them a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Uh, for those of you online, uh, talk to your online moderator, and we'll get those questions in. Online? So, uh, yeah, online. So, uh, anyone? You can't say out there. We have a hand. Yes. We get into it. Ah, cool. <laughs> All right. So you said that you had a physical background and martial arts background. So my question to you is. How often on set did you like get hurt? Because the short films that we do right now, we're trying to experiment with getting hit and everything. And it's like, hey, Tony, so do I actually punch this guy or do I like roll with the punch? And I'm just sitting there like, well, I can take a punch, but I don't think you want to do that. So how do you go about that? Yeah, uh, actually, in fight scenes, there's very there's minimal contact, never to the face. I mean, you know, you're never hit in the face, and if you're asked to work on a production where they they insist on it, you're you're on the wrong one. Um, uh, it's really it's all just staging and camera work, and that's where the action, uh, you know, and the stunt coordinators sort of work together and and with the cinematography and allow it to be shot in a very creative way. Uh, we do it's called stacking, and so, you know, my fist is a good six inches away from my face here, unless camera. If the camera's behind me, you don't see that. So it's all about depth. It's all about uh, camera work and stacking. So um, maybe minimal uh, contact to the body, but again, that's that's on the on the stunt performer's part to work together. And it's really it's like a dance. It's choreography. You know, the punch is coming in, and you know that it's coming in, and you it's acting. Stunts is acting. You know, you're you're portraying a character, and so uh, it's really about that 
that type of choreography, uh, and it's all about the dance. So, yeah, you shouldn't be getting hurt doing fight scenes. Fights shouldn't hurt for real. In fact, that's the joke in the stunt industry, that if we ever got in a real street fight, we'd just throw a bunch of misses and be like, well, what's going on here? <laughs> I know, it's so, so cheesy, right? Um, but anyway, yeah, so don't, uh, I mean, obviously there are, there are certain times when you're trying to sell a very specific move, and you, know, you might have to take some face contact. But again, that should be done very safely and, and set up with a lot of rehearsals so that it, you only have to do one or two takes at most. So um, did I kind of answer your question? Yeah, it's, it's really about the choreography. You know, don't, don't, don't beat yourself up for real, for sure. <laughs> Hi, this one is from uh, Yusuf Prigen on YouTube, and he wants to know, what would you consider your specialty in your stunt work? Great question. Hi, on YouTube. Um, Definitely martial arts and gymnastics. Uh, I, I have a martial arts background, and uh, I was fortunate enough to um, have a gymnastics program in my high school. And so between those two, between uh, my, my martial arts background, and of course, you're, you're always flipping around as a little kid anyway and looking for things to jump off of. Between that and sort of the structured, uh, very rigorous uh, gymnastics training, uh, those were really my foundation, and that was my bread and butter for many years. I did the Mortal Kombat TV series that shot at the Disney MGM Studios at the time, now the Hollywood Studios. And um, and that, you know, fight scenes, I mean, gosh, I, every every TV show that had action, I was very fortunate to work on. Martial Law, VIP, Walker, Texas Ranger, Angel, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, they were all fight-based. It was all, the, the, the uh, conflict was all fight-based. And so fights and fight scenes really kind of, you know, Paid my bills for many years, but um, yeah, like I said uh, previously, ev everything but horses and motorcycles. I leave that to the guys that kind of grew up around them. But um, you know, as you get older, the car stuff definitely becomes more. You, you love getting those calls because you don't have to throw on you, you throw on different kind of pads, but it's less impact in many cases. Um, so yeah. Hey, um, have you like uh, jumped any uh, like large distances? Like, have you covered? Um, like, have you fallen? Like, what's the tallest distance you've fallen? Uh, let's see. I did a 70-foot high fall uh, one time. Uh, That's probably the highest I've fallen. But, uh, I, of course, you know, you, you always, you always want to go higher. You're like, oh, I think I could do 100. Um, yeah, it's really, I mean, if you have a good air sense, you can, you can usually adjust to, to most uh, um, aerial work. And then um, that's, that's the highest I've fallen. Uh, but, you know, you get a lot of, uh, you know, nowadays, high falls are, are much more rare now because we have wire work and safety, you know, that you can either do it on a green screen or you can be on a wire or things like that. Um, but I've done a lot of, like, you know, 40, 50-foot jumps, did some cliff jumping and, and things like that just for various projects. And then uh, as far as I've jumped, gosh, uh, I'm trying to think if I had to clear some distances. I mean, on Pirates 4, I had to, we was doing a, this waterfall jump where there was, a solid like 17 feet of rocks beneath me, and so I had to clear that because if you know you slip and you know you take off, then you're going down into some rocks, so that would have been bad. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as as far as high falls are concerned, 70 is as high as I've gone. And really, for camera nowadays, you know, you can run multiple cameras and make a 70 foot high fall look like 170. It's you know with cuts and editing and things like that, as you guys are well aware of. So yeah. I just had uh, two questions. The first question is that uh, when it comes to stunt men and stunt women, when growing up, did you have anybody to look up to? Yeah, you know, be careful uh, what you let your kids watch because it can be very influence, uh, influential. I saw, and this is before your time, but I saw a great uh, Burt Reynolds movie called Hooper, and he was a stunt man. That was, you know, what he, it was, the, it was a film about him and his career. And I, boy, I saw that when I was in the second grade, and that was it. I just thought that was the coolest thing. I mean, and, and they, they showed everything in that film. I mean, they did horse stuff and motorcycles and fights and high falls and fire, and it was, it was just, I was on overload. And I just, I, I it, again, woven into those early films that I saw that really influenced me. So, um, and it's interesting because, as you guys know, Burt Reynolds actually uh, spent a large part of his life growing up in Florida and actually was a stuntman. Uh, that's how he kind of got into the acting thing. And... Um, but uh, uh, Dar Robinson was a big influence. Dar was a, a great stuntman. Unfortunately, lost his life on a film not doing a stunt. Actually, uh, he was doing a motorcycle scene, and they were going back to one, their first positions. And uh, he just he veered off a cliff and actually, uh, unfortunately, passed away. But I've worked with his sons, uh, uh, Troy and, um, oh gosh, shame on me. He's going to kill me. Uh, I'll think of his name later. Um, but... Uh, 
yeah, Dar Robinson. But if you go all the way back to the greats, I, I, I wasn't necessarily influenced by them um, personally, or, or uh, I didn't know of them at the time. But I'd always knew the scenes. Uh, one of the one of the original stuntmen is Yakima Kanut, and he did that really famous uh, stagecoach slide where he where he mm. did hand over hand underneath the horses, and then ultimately went underneath the. Uh, the carriage, but uh, gosh, Terry Leonard, who was who was one of uh, Harrison Ford's doubles on Raiders, and uh, um, yeah, so many so many great legends in, in the industry growing up. But uh, um, Dar Robinson, Terry Leonard, uh, oh gosh, so many. I, my mind is is filled with all these names. I, none of them are coming to mind. But yeah, this really and the great thing about this industry, and and not even in the stunt realm, is that uh, you can actually you know you end up meeting and working with your heroes, which is really cool. You know, one of the um, films I saw when I first started martial arts was Big Trouble in Little China. And Jeff Imada, Jeff Imada is the guy that does the butterfly knives in every movie. He did Payback with Mel Gibson, and he's, he's famous for his butterfly knives. And I got to meet and work with Jeff on martial law. And, you know, of course, you're on set, and you're in the stunt department, you're trying to act cool and just kind of be, you know, you know, professional. But inside, I'm going, oh, my God, it's Jeff Imada. And uh, so it's really, it's, that's one of the fun uh, uh, aspects of this industry is you can be in, inspired by so many artists and, and creative people. And then if you, you know, uh, have the opportunity to get to work with them and meet with meet with them, and it's just it's a really really cool aspect of it. So yeah. Yes. Right here. Where, left, you, left. Left. Oh, oh there it hey, is. Hey, there he is. Hey. Um, yes, I was wondering. This is a little bit more of a technical question, but I was wondering um, in actual fight scenes, is it better? Because I've heard both both ways of doing it, but is it better to overact uh, hits and things like that, or go for <laughs> realism? Uh, would you say? I, you know, I'd always go for realism um, because, you know, unless you're shooting that, that genre of film, you know, I mean, it's, you know, you have the sort of hyper-realistic films. Uh, one that comes to mind is like Scott Pilgrim versus the world. You know, everything was very over the top and larger than life. And it, 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 it worked because it was, the, it was the, the story style and the genre. So really adapt, uh, you know, it's interesting, Francis Ford Coppola, um, one of one of the films that he made that it really had an impact on me was Tucker, the man in his dream about um, the Tucker automobile, and it was played by Jeff Bridges. And on the on the DVD, uh, the behind the scenes features, and on the director's commentary, Francis said that uh, story should always dictate the story genre should always dictate the style of how the film is made. And so I would apply that to action sequences as well. I mean, if you're doing over the top, you know, sort of. Um, you know, hyper-realistic action, absolutely. Make those hits big and crazy and, and fun. Um, if, they're, if, it's, if, it's, if the drama is more grounded and more real, definitely play the realism. So again, let the genre sort of dictate what your action is gonna look like and how it's, how it's incorporated in the, in the story itself. Uh, right Sean Robinson. Sean? Sean and Troy Robinson, really good guys. Great, great brother team. Sean's a great uh, 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 stunt rigger as well with wire work and things like that. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, so would you happen to know any resources that would be like good learning um, for like stunt etiquette? Um, maybe not so much as from like a stunt person's perspective, but from like a directorial perspective and how to work with stunt men and stunt women? Absolutely. I mean, really, it's about, uh, you know, again, filmmaking is collaboration. And unfortunately, the sad reality of the industry is that it sort of comes with this built in hierarchy, right? The guy who's who's taking care of the honey wagons is perceived as not as important as the director. And so obviously some of that comes into play. Obviously, you know, we have these A-list actors or you have these creative teams that are at the source of the production. They have a, a, a certain value attached to them. But I've always viewed it as, you know what, we're, if the toilets don't get cleaned, we're, the production's shutting down, right? So everyone, on I don't care what they're doing on a film, is, has a role. And we're all... You know, the, these people that get in the industry and they, they, you know, they sort of, you know, you know, the, I'm here to guy, I'm here to tell you guys the realities of the industry because I don't want to sugarcoat it. it. It's a product-based industry, okay? I mean, A-list actors, by their own admission, are products. They, they are money make. They generate money. They generate revenue, right? It's a business. It's not show friends. It's show business, as they said in Jerry Maguire, um, and that is a sad reality. But. Um, just treat everyone with respect, you know? And it's really, there's so many valuable people, I don't care what their role is on the production, that have 
so many great ideas and a lot of great input. That's not to say that a film should become an all-out democracy because you have to have a, vi a vision and you have to, you know, meet um, sort of, you know, time restraints and production restraints and things like that. But just treat people with respect. You know, stunt people are incredibly, are incredibly creative, and a lot of them. I know a lot more. I mean, I know a lot of stunt guys who know more about shooting and editing than many of the producers and directors I've worked with on A-list projects. Uh, myself being, I mean, oh boy, if they heard my inner, inner monologue on this one show, I would have been kicked off the set because this producer that was allowed to direct this episode, I, I couldn't believe it. He was asking everybody, uh, you know, well, now where should we put the camera? Are we cover it from here? And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, give me the camera. So, um, <clears throat> but again, yeah, they're incredibly creative and in just, you know, when it comes to action, Tell them what you're going for story-wise and work together to create it. And um, yeah, we're all people, you know? Like I said, it's, a, it's, it's at the heart of this industry and the heart of story is all about people. So I guess hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm wondering, uh, as, um, as a stunt double, how much do you get paid compared to like regular actors? Compared to regular actors or regular stunt performers? Mm, just, just, just regular actors who just uh, stand in and uh, you know use a lot of dialogue and whatnot. I see. Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. It, just for some clarification, so it's funny because a lot of times stunt people are are thought of as body doubles. We're not body doubles. We're not photo doubles. Um, photo doubles are very specific uh, that look that have the exact body type of the actor, and that's that. Many of those people, that's all they do. Uh, they're photo doubles and or body doubles where they are intended to match the actor perfectly, whether it's for a nude shot or, you know, whatever the case may be, a special shot. A uh, stunt double is obviously there for just the action. Um, and oftentimes we do photo doubling because part of the action is woven into the story where we have to continue the, the acting either before or after the stunt. Um, but again, it's, it's, we're all in the Screen Actors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, and uh, stunt doubles and stunt men all make the same base rate, and actors, I think, we all start out at the same rate as well. And then when you get into, you know, when you get into representation and you have management and your contracts are negotiated, then you can get, obviously, uh, you know, those larger paychecks. But, uh, you know, it's funny, being, a, being like an A-list, I mean, I was a Johnny Depp stunt double for five years, and my, my, I was base rate the whole time. I, you know, people, I had friends that thought I was rolling in it because I was, Johnny, I was like, no, make the same as I did when I, <laughs> you know, when I was just in the background, number number 50, back in the background of, you know, this big war battle scene on some unknown film. So, um, but obviously you can have, a, um, y you know, you build a relationship with an actor or a production company and you can negotiate for higher rates, but it's all just contract based, all, all, all base rate stuff, so. Yes. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, so. I was wondering, was there any particular project that you were really, really passionate about, and how did that compare to all the other projects that you've worked on? Uh, stunts or filmmaking? Both. Okay. You know, I have to say, um, I really, as an audience member, I really loved Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the early years. I, I was like a crack baby for that show. I would be there on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, man. And uh, to be able to work on that set was really... Um, it was really special. It was very cool. And I, actually, I was, I was, I don't know if you guys remember the show, I was Nicholas Brendan's uh, stunt double for season five. And so to go, again, that's one of those situations, to go from background vampire number 12 to climb the ranks and be, get to be Xander's stunt double, you know, number three on the call sheet was really, really cool. So I, was, I had a lot of fun with that. But I definitely, the, the dream project was Pirates, Pirates of the Caribbean 4. Um, you know, mixed reviews from an audience standpoint, but from, from a working standpoint, gosh, what a dream come true. I mean, my favorite ride, my, my two favorite rides at, at Disney growing up were Peter Pan and Pirates of the Caribbean. So if you'd have told that kid riding pirates that he would one day be, you know, Captain Jack Sparrow, even though Jack Sparrow didn't exist back then, I would have, you know, uh, probably pooped in my pants. Uh, <laughs> I'd be like, wait, what? They're making a movie and I get to sword fight and jump off cliffs. Uh, that was really a dream job. Um, from a filmmaking standpoint, I love them all. You know, anytime I get to, to you know, you guys as well as, as artists, I don't care if you're a painter, you're a writer, a poet, a song, uh, you know, a songwriter, a song, you know, a musician. When you have something up here that you can bring to life and you see your vision or your idea come to life, Man, that, that, it doesn't get any better than that. That's why we do this, right? I hope so. I hope that's the answer for everyone in this room. Um, 
it, it drives us. It's that thing, that creativity, that, that spark that allows us to, you know, that keeps us up at night and has us thinking, you know, and these ideas, if I could. So for me, anytime I get to, and again, just, I want to be clear, not just me, I, when a story can come to life and whether that's, you know, again, it goes back to the collaboration. A good idea is a good idea. I don't care if it comes from me or, or you know, another one of my collaborators. Make it the best story you can. So anytime I get to, to creatively work, I have a blast. But um, uh, my last film, my last short film that I did, Muse, which is actually running the Film Fest circuit right now. In fact, next week I'll be in, up in Sonoma at the Sonoma Film Festival. And hopefully here at the Central Florida Film Festival later this year. And maybe you guys can see it. I uh, had, had a blast on that one. It was really, really fun. So, um, yeah, it just... But uh, oh, it's, you know, what a great, what a great, what a silly and fun and great way to make a living, right? I hope. <laughs> Hi. Cool. Um, so since you learned gymnastics and martial arts. Am I in the right tried, room? Oh, over here. Where, oh, there you are. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, have you ever tried something like parkour? Say again? Okay, have you ever tried to um, learn parkour? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, the parkour thing... I, Man, these these people are from another planet, right? I, these kids nowadays coming out. I mean, every time you you click on YouTube, it's a new trick that it, it just blows your mind. They're such incredibly talented uh, brand of individuals, and uh, I sort of was kind of the tail end of my stunt. I shouldn't say tail end of my stunt career. I was my my passions had definitely turned to filmmaking, so I was less interested in the physical side of you know trying to learn a new trick of that nature. Um, and uh, but I've, I've you know I've, of course I train with some of those guys and I'll go to the gyms and and we'll, we'll 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 play around and but I that's not my bag you know those like I said the kids coming up nowadays are like the Red Bull uh, they have the Red Bull kick uh, competitions those guys are just they're aliens they're I'm convinced that they're aliens from another planet that are just they're in human form because they're unbelievably talented and gifted. Um, but parkour, yeah, incredible. What an cr incredible discipline. And had a good, had a, had a decent run in the film industry. I think uh, they used some of that in, um, it was woven into uh, the, die, the last Die Hard film. Um, but it's a very specific skill because unless it's in the story, it's kind of weird to see a guy do a, 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 you know, an inverted front flip up a wall. You're like, wait, well, why did that character just do that? I mean, it looks cool, sure. So, you know, again, uh, about story, but yeah, boy, parkour. Um, I, I've dabbled, that's it. I would not consider myself a, a parkour artist for sure. Those guys are amazing. Hi. Hi. How closely do you work with the actors you're doubling as? Uh, often really close. I mean, we're we're. Uh, that's a great question. Um, again, it's all about. It goes back to the production side of it, to where uh, it's it's the director and the producer and the cinematographers. Uh, the, you know, they sort of discuss how they're going to shoot something and how much they can see of the actor and how much they don't need to. And so, uh, oftentimes, I'm right there. I mean, I've had to deliver lines of dialogue. You know, I mean, and and to be clear, there's also stunt. You know, a lot of stuntmen that make a very good living being stunt actors. Um, there's a guy named Michael Papa John who you you wouldn't know him unless you saw him, and then you'd be like, oh my gosh, that's that guy. You see him in everything. You know, and Jeff Amata too, and Al Leong. You know, Al Leong is sort of the uh, he he's the very recognizable Asian gentleman who's been in gosh everything. He was in Die, the original Die Hard and Last Action Hero and Big Trouble in Little China. All these you know great fun action films. Um, but to come back to your question, yeah, very closely sometimes. Um, in fact, speaking, I was I worked on a really uh, funny kind of silly movie called Stuck on You, and I was doubling for Matt Damon. Uh, right? Exactly. That's everyone's reaction. As soon as you say stuck on you, uh, it's so silly and over the top. It's where Matt Damon and, and uh, Greg Kinnear played uh, Siamese twins. And myself and Mitch Gould, the other stunt double for Greg, we had to literally be so, we were zipped up into this suit that they had made for both both uh, uh, Matt and Greg and, and Mitch and myself, and we were stuck together doing this action. And so there's, there's Matt and Greg, and here's Mitch and I, and we were working with the Farley brothers, and we were walking through the scene, and they were seeing, how are we gonna do this fight scene? This is crazy. We've never done a Siamese twin fight scene before, and it was really silly and fun. And then I ended up doubling Matt uh, again on, on um, We Bought a Zoo. And I, I went up and saw him, and he, he, you can see he, rec he remembered me, but he couldn't place my name. I said, hey, man, I'm Chris. I doubled you on, on Stuck on You. And he goes, oh, what a silly movie that was, huh? <laughs> he goes, but it was fun, it was fun, it was fun. I think it's interesting, and that's a great lesson, a complete side note. That's a great lesson because um, it just goes to show you from, from conception to final production how much a, a film can change. Um, they, I think towards the end of the process, they really tried to add some more sentiment into that film than actually had started out. 
it started out as really this over the top zany comedy, which it kind of was, but on screen they, they they really try to incorporate some some more emotional values, and it it, it kind of it, you know it just it was it was it was different than I think that they originally intended. But um, wrapping up sometimes very closely, so <laughs> a little too close actually when you're in a scene like that. Anyone? Anyone? Um, over here. Oh yes. Um, I was wondering like if. Somebody was wanting to do like concept art for an action movie. Would you suggest that they study um, films that have like action sequences and study like the stunt doubles and what they do? Great question. It's one I've never heard before. Um, I, you know what? Not so much. I think if you're a concept, are you talking about storyboarding? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Storyboarding is an incredible, incredible gift and um, incredibly helpful uh, you know as I'm sure you guys know storyboarding started in the animation world at, at the Disney Studios and leaked into the rest of the film industry and became an incredibly useful tool for, for pre-visualization so um, I mean my advice to people in the film industry is in addition to whatever schooling you're involved in watch movies because that's that's the end product that's the end result and that is ultimately you're gonna you're gonna walk away with a lot uh, um, of, of influence from that. And so <clears throat> if, you're, if you're wanting to do that, that type of storyboarding, then sure, focus on the action sequences and see how they're shot. Or even movies that just speak to you that are shot well, you know, because you can really help uh, create that vision. And so, um, you know, again, I, I don't know that you'd have to get too specific with it, because I think your art, you know, would really, you know, your vision is gonna help, is gonna go into your work and that's gonna help someone, you know, hopefully see their vision. And then you'll, if you're, if you're at that uh, stage, you obviously there'll be collaboration there and they'll say, oh, I love this, but actually can we make, you know, that angle this way or have the character enter from this, you know, side or anything. But uh, yeah, just watch movies and then, you know, use that towards your, towards your input and motivation. Homework is to watch movies. That is your, that's, yeah. That, I mean, that you should be doing that anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Hi. Hey. Hi. Um, this is uh, more along the lines of uh, kind of the, the business aspect of it, but uh, I love it. I've looked into things like stunt schools and things like that, but they always seem very sketchy um, for an inordinate amount of money, for an inordinate amount of time. I just want to know like, what your thoughts are on these sort of like stunt schools, get be a stuntman sort of thing. Absolutely. Great question. Uh, certainly no disrespect to the stunt schools because m most of them are run by professionals. However, in my personal opinion, I, I don't place a lot of value on stunt schools because, you know, would you go to a doctor who learned how to be a doctor in a month? <laughs> I, I wouldn't. And it's a very, it, it, you know, it's, while we all have different levels of physicality and we, you know, some people can pick up things faster than others for sure. But <clears throat> what I do think you walk away from at those schools is maybe some of the theory behind it, but I don't know that they're, <laughs> excuse the pun, there's, I don't know of any really credible crash courses for stunts because it is really a it's it's something that needs to be acquired over time you know I mean I spent years of my career you know learning you know different a aspects and avenues of, of I mean years <clears throat> and I was working I was working on you know some of the biggest films so it's really about that that the time that you're putting in the experience and the and the you know you're soaking it all up you know and anything physical requires you know some time. So <clears throat> again, they can be a little bit pricey. I'm not. I'm not discounting them altogether because you. You know. You can. You can. You can get a lot of uh, of good out of it. I personally never attended one. I. I have never really recommended it. In fact, I'm so. I don't really. I'm not in that realm. So I don't really know of what's out there anymore. So, but you know the the again Google's a great uh, a great resource. Google and see you know talk to people that have gone and see what they think of it. If you know if if you're getting some good feedback, by all means you know maybe go check it out and. And talk to people, but um, I personally am not really a big. Uh, <clears throat> I don't really push for stunt schools per se. Hi, this is another one um, oh. from. Hi. Hi. In the back. Oh. This is another one from Yusuf Prigen on YouTube. He wants to know when doing a fighting sequence, how long do you normally spend with actors, getting them up to speed with a style of fighting that they are not accustomed to, in order to make it look authentic. That's a great question. You know, it's interesting. Films, you know, in the old days, films used to take sometimes up to six months to film. Now they can crank out movies in two and a half. And because filmmaking is so expensive, 
we, we don't get as much time with the actors as we sometimes would like. And um, because their schedules are very tight between the actual production and downtime and things like that. So again, it really goes back to the individual case of if, if the action is pretty involved uh, and they need to be you know, seen well and we need to believe that it's them, oftentimes we will get you know, them for a couple hours here or there for a day. Uh, you know, maybe over a week's time. But in television, I mean, as you guys know, television moves very quickly, and there really is hardly any time to rehearse. So um, we grab them when we can, and when they'll allow us to, and say, hey, you know, can we have you for 30 minutes? You know, here's the fight scene we're going to be shooting tomorrow, or whatever. Um, and it would just build from there, depending on how complicated it is. And if it gets too complicated, then they'd probably just use a double for um, the majority of the action, then just do, you know, insert shots and just, you know, tights on their face so we can believe it's them every once in a while. But... Yeah, really just, uh, it's it's case by case, and but we try to get some rehearsal when we can, for sure. Yeah. Hey, how are you? How does something like animation affect both aspects of what you do now? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, for a while there was there was definitely a, a time period in the, in the film industry where, an, where CGI and animation was becoming very heavily involved. I mean, a great example would be the Lord of the Rings films. I mean, look at, you know, in the old days, you know, when they shot Ben Hur, you know, those were extras. Those were real extras. That they, you know, thousands of extras. Sometimes they would have running across a field or being involved in a battle sequence. Now you can do it in a computer, right? So, but again, it's really, it's it's still all about people. And I don't. For a while there, there was this sort of belief that oh gosh, stuntmen are going to be replaced. And I don't think they will ever be replaced. But I look at it again as as a collaboration and just one more tool that can make things that can make things better. Um, you know, a lot of times it's they do a combination of live action and CGI, and it's great. In fact, I've I've sometimes worked more in rehearsal than I did on the actual project because we were doing motion capture. Motion capture. Um, anybody see the movie Tintin? I was uh, Andy Serkis's stunt double and uh, for the Captain Haddock character, and we had I was on camera. You know, maybe two or three days, but I was rehearsing all the time for that thing. We had to dial it in with the the motion capture cameras and all the all the technology involved. So. Um, I think it's just one more level to it, uh, but it can be incredibly. It, make no mistake, it can definitely, um, it can definitely take the place of, of certain action sequences for sure. As an audience member, and, and you know now audiences have become smarter and smarter. It it takes me a little bit out of the story when I see it, but uh, when it's used well and it's done well, it's so effective. I mean, just off the top of my head, you look at the Harry Potter films with the CGI. That that is a perfect use of CGI. It's magic, right? Industrial light and magic, right? ILM, that's their, it's in their name. That stuff is magical. You can't create that practically. And it's such a great use. And it, it, it adds that layer of depth to the story. So that is a perfect example of how I think it can be so useful and definitely uh, um, you know, huge in story value. Um, sometimes it's cheaper. I mean, let's make it face it. As an independent filmmaker, I've used digital effects. I, you know, I've used after Effects for some blood when a guy got shot and I, you know, a blood pack on the day, sure, would have been more effective, also would have been more expensive and time consuming and I didn't, I didn't have, you know, a chance to do it. So digitally, it, it has made things a lot easier. Um, but again, it really comes down to how the story impact and hopefully it has a positive story app, uh, uh, impact. But I have nothing but respect for animators, man. I'm a huge Pixar guy, I think. And even, I mean, well, I have, actually, across the board nowadays, DreamWorks, Disney, and Pixar, gosh, they're, they're cranking out such great films. So, and you guys are incredibly gifted, for those of you who are animators. I was not. If you need a stick figure flip book, I'm your guy. Anything more than that, I leave it to you. <laughs> this one is from Josh Gerson on YouTube. Hey, and Josh? he would like to know, what is your advice when doing stunts with children? Don't. Uh, <laughs> animals and children, avoid them at all costs. No. Um, you really, it, it's, that's going back to where we started with all this. It really comes down to you really want a top-notch uh, professional. Um, there are a lot of little people, uh, uh, many of them who are my friends, little people and dwarves who, are, who, who stunt double for children. Um, and you really want to avoid using kids, unless, it, unless they are, you know, I mean, my gosh, world-class gymnasts, they're, they're, they're pretty much stunt men and women as it is. Um, if they are working in the industry and they are stunt professionals and that's the route they're on, by all means, use a child. Uh, but definitely, you know, make that very clear <laughs> that they are a stunt professional and not just a kid who's 
like I said, sort of falls in the daredevil category. Um, but little people are, are, and dwarves are incredibly, there, there's a fantastically uh, talented community of those individuals who that's, that's what they do. They're, they're, they're so gifted and so talented. And yeah, leave it, leave it to the pros because the last thing you want to do is, I mean, you don't want to hurt anyone, but my goodness, you don't want to get a kid hurt doing something silly. Yeah. Over here. Yep. Yes. Yep. Got me? Got me? Yes, there he is. <laughs> All right, so here's a question for you. Yes. Have you ever or have you even thought about being like motion capture for a video game at all? I've done a lot of motion capture for video games, yeah. Um, uh, gosh, uh, there was a uh, company that's no longer in existence called House of Moves out in Los Angeles. And I did, a, I, did uh, I think, three capture sessions with them uh, for, for video games. Um, Back when the film came out and they were they were creating the game for it, I was uh, asked to do the Matrix video game, but unfortunately I had a work conflict and I had to turn it down. Um, but yeah, I've done a lot of I did, did some blue screen for video games and green screen, and then also motion capture as well. Yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, motion capture is great. You know, you can create some really really uh, effective action and story stuff with motion capture, and it's it's a really fun realm. So yeah, it, it's so cool. Anyone else? We have time for maybe a few more. No, yes, no. One more. Here we go. All right. This is uh, pressure's on. Yes. Big okay. questions. Go out with a bang. Ooh, goodness. Um, this is more of a little bit of a personal one relating to the Pirates 4. Sure. Um, about when you doubled for Johnny Depp, um, two, two like layers to this. A, did you do any sword fighting scenes or fight scenes like that? And B, did you have to simulate his character when you did that? You know, he has a very particular way of presenting himself uh, seeming basically drunk all the time. So did you have to simulate that while you were uh, doing those fight scenes if you did them? That was how I got the job. Uh, no, I, I'm serious. That was the very first thing. You know, my good friend, uh, who's a big second unit director and stunt coordinator, George Marshall Ruge, he did the Lord of the Rings films. We did National Treasure 2 together. He's done, he did all the Pirates films. It's such a, it's a, I owe, owe him so much. So if George, if you ever see this, you are the man. Uh, and he knows how grateful I am and so much fun that experience was. But I had, that was the first thing I had to prove. He's like, you got the stunt stuff down. Let me see you do the Jack Sparrow walk. And I, you know, I had to do the whole, you know. But again, it, it goes back to watching films. I mean, I, I had watched the, you know, having worked on the films and then watched them and really enjoyed them, I already kind of had that, um, kind of had it sort of, you know, in my, in my head. So, yeah, that's actually, he's like, we need, because it's going to be you half the time. We need to believe it, this, that you're Jack Sparrow, you know. Why is the rum always going? So uh, <laughs> that was a big part of it. In fact, it, you know, let's face it, Johnny is one of the biggest stars in the world, and his time is valuable from a production standpoint. And if he's not need, needed on set, he's not there. So if you're not seeing Johnny's face in that film, I can almost guarantee that you're watching me. So, um, and, and again, not, I mean, he's the man, you know? I mean, he created the character. It was my job to help replicate that. And, you know, again, if he doesn't need to be there, he, you know, he's not going to be there. So uh, I was incredibly fortunate to be in a position to where the acting was so much a, a part of the character. Because again, the little, the little kid in me was like, Pirates of the Caribbean, are you kidding me? So uh, it was a lot of fun. But yeah, the, the, the swagger, whatever, you know, whatever, the sway, whatever they called it, um, was a huge part of it. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, if, you, if anyone is looking to be a stunt double and you think you're a good look for someone and you're sort of coming up those, those, uh, those ladders, you know, watch their films and see how they move and act. Because if you can get that down, that's one more level of, uh, of I won't say guarantee, but definitely an edge that can give you, you know, an advantage when trying to get those, those jobs and those roles. Yes, no, maybe so. All right. I think last one, then we'll get out here and we'll all go grab some dinner. Who's buying? There he is. Oh, I'm buying. <laughs> no, I'm, in, I'm trying to get out of the stunt industry. Those, those residual checks are drying up. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yes, last question. Where are you? Uh, over here. Oh. Yeah, this way. There he is. Uh, something that you mentioned a couple times was Mortal Kombat. Are you talking about the series? Did you mean Mortal Kombat Legacy? And if so, <laughs> what have you done? I just had this conversation. It's kind of funny. Uh, it's interesting because it's such a it's such a multi generational show, right? It's like Ninja Turtles. You have to definitely be specific about which which. Uh, project you're on. I did the Mortal Kombat uh, Conquest TV series. We filmed uh, in 1998 and 99, so it was a while ago. But that was, like I said, what I got my SAG card on. And I, I pretty much doubled every character on that show. It was relatively low budget. 
Um, I was, you know, Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Reptile, every ninja you could think of, all the background characters. I was actually, they, they had a really difficult time finding, because uh, Paolo Montalban, who was an incredibly nice guy and a great actor, he was Kung Lao, but the guy's 6'3", and he's Asian, and it was really hard to find an Asian martial artist uh, that tall. And so they had a gentleman, uh, a good friend of mine, J.J. Perry, who was actually Caucasian, because they, you know, in the, in the Screen Actors Guild, as I'm sure you guys know, and, and you definitely want to play by the rules, you really do have to try to exhaust your possibilities. And they did, they did, they, they had a multi-city search, and they came up zero. And so J.J. was actually uh, Paolo's original stunt double, but J.J. was also the character Sub-Zero. And I got thrown into uh, the episode when J.J. needed to be Sub-Zero, and again, because it was a budgetary thing, I just kind of stayed in there. So I was actually Kung Lao for most of that show. And it's so funny because on the, uh, on the blog site, uh, people would write, oh my gosh, Paolo is such a great martial artist. And they were so fortunate to find such a good actor and a good martial artist. And I was like, uh, it was a 5'9 white guy. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's so much fun on that show. We, we had a really good time. But yeah, so sorry, to answer your question, Mortal Kombat Conquest. The, I guess the new stuff that they're coming out with now is, is pretty amazing as well. You know, it, it, you know we're, we're in the digital age of reboots, right? I mean, my goodness. You know, they, in the old days, you had to wait 20 years before you get to remake a movie. Now they're, they're doing it every two years. You know? I mean, how many Spider-Men are we up to now? I've lost count. You know? <laughs> but hey, you know what? From a stunt standpoint, it's, it's great work. So. But uh, anyway, I guess in closing, I can't thank you guys enough for all your great questions and for your time. And um, you know, like I said, uh, just wrapping things up, if you're looking to get into the stunt industry, just you know, be safe, be smart. There's plenty of resources out there for you to look into. Ask the, ask the professionals, because you don't, you don't want to ruin your, not only your career, but your life by doing something silly and, and stupid and getting hurt, because it's just it's unnecessary. Uh, it happens as it is on the safe stuff and the real, you know, on the, the legitimate project. So, uh, but from a filmmaking standpoint, if you're looking to use action in your movie, like I said, uh, same thing. Plenty of resources here in Central Florida between the theme parks and the stunt professionals that are here and in the southeast. So definitely reach out to those guys and ask for advice, not help. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. And follow your passions, follow your dreams, and. Just stay persistent because there's a lot of a lot of competition. So, but if you're if you're true to yourself and true to your passions and and your endeavors, you'll uh, you'll definitely be positioned uh, in a place where you you know again can have an edge uh, of making it making it work. So, good luck, and uh, I wish you guys all the best. And thank you so much. Thank you.